Hello, everyone. Welcome to Adobe Live. I'm Benjamin Ward. I am a product manager on the Lightroom team. And welcome back to day two with Margaret Alba. Margaret is a photographer with, I must say, a diverse body of work, uh, but specializing in documentary family photography. Uh, I will turn this show over to her in just a moment. But first, let me say just a few housekeeping items. Um, if you are watching our live stream on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you may wish to consider watching us on Behance because on Behance, we have live chat, uh, a chat pod where you can submit questions uh, for Margaret. Um, if you wish to switch over to Behance, it is be.net slash Adobe Live. Um, and then I also wanna say, be sure to check out the first week of Photoshop Daily Creative Challenge replays. That is every weekday at 9 a.m. Pacific. Don't miss out on this new set of challenges. Um, I will be monitoring the chat throughout Margaret's presentation today, uh, the chat on Behance. Um, so if you have questions for Margaret, submit them in the chat. Um, I will relay your questions to her. Uh, yesterday, we watched Margaret go through the process of selecting and editing pics from a, a day in the life documentary uh, family photography shoot. And today, uh, we're gonna learn how Margaret creates a slideshow of those photos using Adobe Premiere. Uh, Margaret, I will turn it over to you. Is there anything else uh, you want to tell us about what you'll be covering today? Um, no, I think you've covered that. Yeah, we'll be using yesterday's um, selects uh, that we converted to JPEGs, and then we'll be throwing them into a slideshow. You want to tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here? It looks like your, is this your portfolio? Yeah, so this was the portfolio that didn't load yesterday, and so it managed to load today. And so it's just a variety of portraits, stay in the life work, uh, wedding work. Um, yeah. <laughs> and let me say hello to a few people in chat. I see we have some folks already. Hello, Robert. Hello, Sean. Hello, Jan. Thank you for joining us today. All right, so I'll close that and get started on what we were working on yesterday. So <clears throat> let's see. We have our final images that we converted to JPEGs. And what we're gonna do is today put them together into a slideshow. We're not gonna use all the images because um, that for a day in the life, it ends up being too long for the full do is kind of pick the best ones that we think will work together to tell the story of the day. Um, usually what I do is I grab at least one of the files and throw them in here. So um, I'll grab all of them and put them in my little library. So is that I'm a, I'm completely ignorant about Premiere. Mm -hmm. So are you just, are you adding these photos to Premiere by just dragging them from Bridge? Is that what you're doing? Yes. Okay. And it's kind of nice the way we can do that. And anything that you update, like if I decided to go and update this file right here, um, maybe I wanted to add some saturation and convert it to black and white. Uh, it should automatically update it here in this catalog as well. So I don't have to re-drag it over. That's really cool. So it's like linked essentially to the, mm -hmm. okay, great. Yep. And then I can put this to the side. The first thing I want to do is it automatically um, sets it uh, to it's about a second and a half. So I want to change the speed and duration of the, every frame um, to about two. Let's see, I'm just going to drag it. And that way, it just allows enough time for somebody to see the image and not get um, 
it, it's not like flipping through images so fast, but fast enough that we also don't feel like it's lingering too long. Um, and then I like to throw an image into the project uh, timeline, just because it'll set the project automatically to the specifications of whatever this um, image is. So it'll automatically convert it to the size and quality. Um, and I'm probably gonna use this image actually for that. Let's see. Actually, what I might do, since we have so many images, we have 212 images that we converted to JPEG. Um, and I'm actually gonna delete them right now. And I will go through Bridge and just grab the ones that we'll use for the slideshow. And that will really help seeing them in Bridge. So I like all these as a potential opening. Um, I don't know if I would use this dishwashing one just because um, I think it's a nice memory, but I, it's also, uh, it would kind of be a weird segue between these two scenes. So I'm not just not gonna use it. Instead, I'll use these wake up images. I like this one. And then I like having a close in. And then I'll have mom waking up the oldest. Um, then I'll have her with her cuddle time here, I think will be nice. But we only need we have like a whole series of wake up images. We only need a few. And then I like this one. I might grab this one too. Kind of like this interaction here. So we'll see how these look. And then this image we might use to transition us into the kitchen setting. And you could presumably add some of these to your, to Premiere now and then come back and you can, you can, you don't have to add them to Premiere all up front. You could come back and grab some more. Yeah. And later. Yep. Is that okay? If I change my mind, I can absolutely switch around. I like this little playtime scene, so I'm going to grab a few from there. Um, there's a question from Sean, and yeah. I'm not sure if you can answer this because I don't know if you've used Lightroom Classic, but Sean is asking, what are the benefits of using Premiere to make the slideshow um, versus uh, the benefits of using Lightroom Classic? But if that's not something you've done, that may not be something you can speak to. I've only used Lightroom once or twice to make a slideshow. So I really can't speak too much to it. I think Premiere just has so much capability. Um, I, you know, I have friends who use Lightroom that I think um, really like how quickly they can make a slideshow with it. Um, but I like to be able to customize volume settings and um, play with the title and uh, I don't, I mean, I don't do a lot with the title, but <laughs> just a little bit of customization here and there. I feel like um, for me, it helps, just helps me kind of like, I guess, set the slideshow apart from maybe others. And then um, adds just a little bit extra uh, emotive touch to it. So that's why I like using Premiere Pro. It just has a lot more, from my understanding, it has a lot of capability, but I, I just really don't know. No, I, th I think that's probably a fair answer. I mean, Premiere is a complete full-fledged video editor that lets you do yeah. anything, really. Um, yeah. So I think, I think the, the, in a nutshell, the difference is probably Lightroom Classic will give you something fast and simple. Um, and Premiere is more involved, but lets you do probably pretty much whatever you want. 
would be my guess. Um, but Lightroom Classic, if you just want something simple, it does allow basic things like add in music, add in a title at the front, things like that. So I'm just going through picking out images for each scene that I think will work. Um, and I'm trying to make sure that I have some kinds of like transitional elements between each scene that um, maybe introduce a setting. So like, I think this image helps to kind of introduce to where they are. Um, let me see if I can find another example. Like this outdoor one, just something that helps set the scene. As opposed to say a close up detail. So, like this poem, I wouldn't just throw in an image of this poem, but I like that they're reading it here before I throw in the detail of the close up of the poem. Yeah, I'm probably not going to include any of these because they're, I didn't spend a lot of time there, whereas these haircut ones are kind of a mini story in the, in the day. This um, entryway image will be my scene setter. And I'll probably grab that one. I like this detail of the hair. Probably three or four of this moment. Let's see. I like this one where he's, you can see him. And then we're gonna do, we're gonna look at the scene of the oldest sister getting her hair cut. So I think this one is a great way to segue into her haircut. And then they're looking at the phone, like watching a tutorial. I think this is kind of a nice tense moment of it. And then we kind of close out that scene here. And I think this helps, this image kind of helps segue into um, kind of this dinner scene. So they're back here crafting. We could make a scene out of the crafting and add it to the images that I didn't use before. Um, I'll, I'll keep going and just see how many images we have. And if we need more, then I'll come back and make a scene out of that. That one. I like this mirrored head padding. And then she introduces this um, little turtle, which is the dog toy that um, he comes up again a couple of times throughout the evening. So I like this introduction of him and then he isn't a super random toy. Um, just hanging out on her shoulder and in, in these other scenes. I like this close up of the braids. I think it's a really sweet moment. Yeah. Hey Margaret, while you're going through this, there's a there's a nice question uh, from Sean uh -huh. in the in the chat, um, and and Sean says, sorry if you went over it yesterday, um, but do you have the clients set up normal activities for the day of the shoot? This feels like a lot going on in one day. <laughs> um, this was actually I I think it's I think it was kind of a low key day for them, is what they said. Because normally they would have had karate and um, maybe a couple of other things, but they 
they went on a hike just to kind of get out and then they were supposed to have karate, but they ended up just hanging out at home instead. Um, so it just depends. Sometimes there are families that I think, you know, they have, they might have, um, an idea in mind of like what kind of day they want documented. I have a lot of families who just want like the first half of the day documented because they have young kids. So the first half of the day is usually really busy. It's, um, the waking up breakfast, uh, playing, um, and then around the afternoon nap, that's when they'll, um, they'll end the session. Um, these girls are a little older, so they don't need that. And then uh, for families who want to do a fuller day, sometimes they'll ask, especially if it's their first time doing a day in the life, they might ask like, hey, what should we do? <laughs> like, um, are we interesting enough? Um, can we, you know, is there enough that we can capture just as a normal day? And so I'll send them a slideshow of like a past client. Oh, I love this mirrored image. Um, just to help them get an idea that they don't need to be super duper busy and they're probably doing all these things every day anyways. Um, and that helps them kind of be a little bit more at ease about things. I like this, this is a low key day for them. One person's overly full day is another person's low key day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. For me, it'd be like, oh man, I walked the dog today. I'm, I'm beat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it might be that, um, you know, they might quote unquote pack the day a little bit more of things that they love to do as a family. So I know that when I've had my family documented, we almost always go get ice cream because we have a favorite little ice cream shop that we go to. Um, so we always make a point of doing that and it's kind of become like a tradition in our day in the lives. And then I feel like, um, th I feel like there's just always enough somehow, you know, people tend to surprise themselves by how much there is because it's a lot of, it's just like these sweet little moments, you know, that they're, um, that they're wanting captured and that happens. You don't have to have like a super busy day to have that. All right, so she's saying goodnight to her. Uh, I'll grab both of these and just see which one I want. And then she's getting her bedtime ready. So I only need one of these blow dry pictures. I think I'll grab this one. <clears throat> And I kind of laugh about it. Um, this was actually a random picture from the day after, but I might use that. All right, so now we'll throw those selects into the library here. All right, I've got about 113. And we'll probably end up getting rid of some of that too. And then we're going to adjust the duration of each one each image. And I like to do that now so I don't have to worry about it later. Okay, we'll throw one of these in to set the um, parameters of the project itself. Um, and then I know that I've got a video with a um, where they're reading the poem. So I'm going to quickly look at that in audition to see if I can clean up the audio a bit and use that for, for the slideshow. So this is audition. I'm and then all I'm doing is I'm grabbing this move file. I'm throwing it into Audition and it's just gonna grab the audio from it. And I'm gonna take a listen. We might take a little while. 
Okay, so might, like, right there. you can hear them talking a little bit. Um, and the noise isn't super, it's not too bad, but I want to just see if I can clean it up anyway. Um, so here you can see where I can control what part of the track I'm looking at. And I just want a section where there's a pause long enough that I can look at the white noise. Let's see, maybe right there. And then what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna highlight this little section of white noise. I'm gonna go to effects, Let's see, noise reduction. I'm gonna capture noise print. And what that's doing is it's analyzing this frequency to use for later. I'm gonna deselect that whole thing. And I'm gonna go back to effects, do noise reduction, and it's gonna reduce the noise of the overall, the overall clip. Here you can control by how much that noise reduction is and the sound level that you want it reduced by. And that looks pretty good right now to me. And you can see how that is just a straight line right now. We'll take a quick listen at what that no white noise sounds like now. Your house. Like awesome. It's so much cleaner. Okay, so we'll save that. And let me let me let me back you up just one second, Margaret. Mm -hmm. I was answering a question in chat, and I think I missed your transition here um, to audition. So this is audio that you captured on the scene when you were yes. taking pictures, and you'll use it as as part of the soundtrack in your slideshow. Yes. Yeah. And then okay. And then this noise reduction. This is something that you couldn't do in Premiere, so you came to audition to do that. Is that? Yeah. Okay. I think I'm up to speed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I hope everyone else is too. Uh, yeah. I um uh one of the girls, um, we had met this family before, they're friends of ours. And so um I had asked one of the girls to write a poem that I would record the day of. And so uh, there was just a moment where the parents were out for the afternoon and I said, okay, let's record that right now. And um, so they, this is just a clip of them recording and I did it on my camera. I didn't have to get any special tools. I have like a little road mic on top of my camera to help with the, uh, with the audio capture. And then I can clean up the sound in here and save it as a wave file. And then let me just make sure that I can pull that over. Um, there it is. This should be it. And we'll put that into, we'll try to pull that over anyway. That was just drag and drop not working for some weird reason that we don't know. Yeah. And you, so you just did use the contextual annoyed. menu to say place in Premiere? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So now I've got that audio file here and I can figure out what part of the audio I want to use. And so I've got two project folders here. One is the sound and one is the from the folder that I titled Adobe. And then... I already know at what point I want to introduce their audio. Um, so I just want to make sure though that I have the right spot. Okay. Wait, okay, so right before she asked, wait, it's recording right now? <laughs> That's when I want to introduce them. <clears throat> and it's about right here. I use these little markers that can help to mark where I where I want things. Wait, to record again? To record again? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And then I 
I think it lasts, let me see. You end up hard to make, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I can tell that they're in the middle of trying to figure out where they're reading the poem to. Um, Good. Okay, so right before. Together before bed. And that everlasting feeling of home. Boom. Right there is where I want to cut it off. So I'm just using this razor tool to chop up my audio. All right, so there's a section of audio that I know I'm going to use. I'm going to put that at the very beginning. And now I'll add my files. So I have these intro files that I'm gonna use to introduce the home. But I wanna give myself a little space because I also know I'm gonna add a title. All right, and that's probably enough time to add the title. Um, let's see, I'm going to grab this bathroom image too, and I'm going to add it somewhere in here. I think I'll put it right in here. Wait, it's recording again? It's recording right now? Mm -hmm. Home, the smell of freshly baked goods, plants, and Kona's rough but soft. Cool. I like that she refers to Kona, the dog, right at that point where we see that puppy pad or the puppy imprint. All right, so then I'll start adding in other files. Actually, I'm going to just see. This one over to just to make sure there's um, the section about the dog. Um, I want to make sure it lines up pretty well um, where the poem and the uh, images line up pretty well with each other. So let's see. Wait, it's recording again? It's recording right now? <laughs> Home, the smell of freshly baked goods, plants, and Kona's rough but soft fur. The sound of laughter ringing. All right, awesome. It still introduces Kona. They have a little shine at the, at the same time in both the audio and the images. All right, so I'm going to grab some of these waking up pictures. Be happy with these, bring these over. I think I'll use this image as an introduction to their room because that's where that image is. Um, that little window decor. I'll grab these. I'm gonna try to leave a few out because I think right now I've got about 113 images and I think that's gonna to be too many. So I'm gonna try and leave some out as we as we pull some from the library here. And for anybody who's joined us recently, we're watching um, Margaret Alba. Uh, photographer specializing in documentary family photography. And yesterday we got to see Margaret's process for selecting and editing uh, photos from a shoot. And today we're getting to see how all those photos get put together into a slideshow in Adobe Premiere. Um, and we have live chat uh, on Behance. So if you want to join us at be.net be slash Adobe Live, you can ask questions in the chat. Um, and I will relay those questions to Margaret. I should also, while I'm talking, say uh, that in an hour from now, we'll be doing our artist spotlight. 
Um, this is uh, where we highlight uh, an artist on Behance um, and just take a few minutes to appreciate their work. Um, you can submit yourself or anyone you know um, for consideration to be shown uh, during the artist spotlight. Um, so we'll be, we'll be checking out an artist uh, there a little bit later today, uh, in just about an hour. All right, and then I'm actually gonna grab, I have more, I have some music that it's already licensed. Um, and I think I'll add that now so I have a better idea of just how long, how much audio track I've got. Dog paws padding on the hardwood floors that ground you. The taste of your family's favorite foods are the fresh air. <clears throat> you want to start again? Okay. All right. So right there after she asks, do you want to start again? Um, that's where I kind of want to, I think I'd like to introduce the music, but at a lower volume. All right, so I'm going to break up a couple chunks here because they're going to be at low, different volumes. Let's see if that's low enough because I want I want to make sure that my the poem is louder. You want to say it again? Okay. Can be a little too loud. Great. I'm gonna get it here. So I'm gonna bring this down even more. Come back here and see how that sounds. Oh. Home, the smell of freshly baked goods might even go quieter than that. Plants and Kona's rough, rough but soft. Okay, I think that sounds okay. How did you how did you open those audio controls? I missed that part. Uh, so audio clip mixer up here. Okay. And that's where I can look at the different audio tracks. I have A1, A2, and A3. And so I'm looking at A2 right now, which is where the music is. Got it. Um, and then I can take the master volume on A2 and bring it down. Um, if I needed to, I could raise the volume on the poem, but I, I think that would be too loud. And then here, when I am fading, I'm going to fade out the sound from the poem. Actually, maybe I don't want that. I think I'll clear the transition here. Uh, right here, I have a little clip of audio where I'm gonna that I'm gonna use to transition to a, a louder music, if that makes sense. Because once the poem ends, I want the music to um, to be the prominent audio that we hear. So let's see. We're gonna look at this little clip of audio. And I know it starts out at negative 26.5. So that's where we want this clip to start. It's okay if it's not perfectly at it, as long as it's pretty close that it's not um, jarring to hear the difference. And then, we're gonna bring it down here and we're gonna set the audio to, let's try about 12, 11.9. Let's see what that fade sounds like. And that everlasting feeling of home. Okay, so we're gonna set, you can see like once I click on 
this other audio track, um, it jumps to zero decibels and we want it, we want to bring that down to 12 to match where it ends, 11.9. And that way we have a seamless transition between the two audio levels. All right, that sounds good. And for that middle clip, so you, you set, how did that work? Sorry, you set like keyframes like at the beginning and the end to like ramp it up, ramp the volume up yes, over that time. Yes, yeah, so uh, earlier I brought in that music and then I knew that I wanted this earlier bit of music to be at a quiet volume and the later bit to be at a more normal volume, I guess more prominent. So I just chopped a little clip in the beginning so that I could fade the two together. And then I set a keyframe at the beginning of it right here and then another at the end right here so that it could uh, fade and up, ramp up something, <laughs> something up. All right. How, did, how did you set those keyframes? Um, so right here, I used the levels, the volume uh -huh. levels, and then let me click on this one. So right here, I set, um, I just set the volume where I want it to be, and then it'll automatically put in a keyframe right there. And then I brought it down here and set it the volume where I wanted it to be. Oh, okay. And it would automatically put in a keyframe right there. Got it. So me. you didn't have to do anything special to say, to set the keyframe. You just, when yeah. you change the volume on a given clip, it automatically sets keyframes. Right? Yeah, wherever you're, you've got this little marker. So I could probably put it one right here and see how it automatically added that little got it diamond. Yeah, but I don't want that to happen. Although I'm curious what it sounds like. So it's ramping it up and you can see the decibels change. Um, We'll take that out. Well, I hope everyone else here is as ignorant of Premiere as I am. Otherwise, they're going to be really bored of my questions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Premiere Pro is um, it. It's awesome because it's so. It's got so many capabilities, but it can also be very overwhelming to learn. Um, and I know that there's so much that I don't know. I'm just grabbing some more in images and we've got, let's see, we're not even halfway through our audio track. So I'm gonna deselect those because I know that for the bathroom, I wanna introduce it with this black and white image here. Introduce her cutting it, little hairs, and then an image of him. And I'll introduce her haircut. Segue into dinner. Once you add uh, an image into your slideshow timeline, it'll automatically put this little film strip on the on an image um, once you've already added it, which is really nice because sometimes I'll forget whether or not I've added something. So it's nice to have that there. All right, and then I played some games and I wanna make sure that these images kind of help to relay the tension of the game playing. Um, I'm gonna use this one where she cuddles with her mom as the last image of the, hello, as the last image of the game. Right. 
this little bed lamp um, image, I think I'm going to have that as last. So I'm going to put that right there to remind me. All right, I don't know if we'll have enough images to get us all the way. So we have two options here. We can either cut down the audio. Actually, it looks like the audio isn't even flush all the way. So I'm gonna bring that all the way over. Um, let's see what corrections I can make right now. Wait, it's recording again? It's recording right now? Mm -hmm. Okay. We can take a look and see if there's spots where maybe we can add in images, like maybe that playing, that little craft time. All right, so we'll grab the craft time images and see if we can insert that somewhere. All right, so here are the two times that they did the crafting. I'm going to give that a different label. I'll drag those over. And while they're still highlighted, I'll see if I can find a spot to put them. Let's see, probably some time before or after dinner. Maybe after dinner because I like the segue of the hair and then the cuddling, hugging out the hair, sadness. So I'm using these donuts as a way to segue into um, dessert and games. And then I've got this image here where she's crafting in the background, which is a great way to introduce that. So I'm gonna grab these and drag it right here. And I can tell by this gap that I don't know if that'll be enough, but we'll just try it. I think there's actually a fast way to like shove those in there and I just didn't want to do it at that point. Okay. That actually might work out pretty well. I'm going to use this image where I can see, I like that I can see the setting and these pictures, these family pictures. So I'm just going to pull that out and use that as kind of a way to conclude the craft scene. All right, and then I actually, I'd like to take out an image or two now. Mm, let's see. I know I've got a lot in the games and in the bedtime scene, so I might take out one or two from each.
All right, I probably just need one of these cutaways. So I'm gonna take that one out. I use ripple delete to kind of pull that together and delete the gap. Okay, that worked out pretty well. I'm just gonna add a fade to that last image. And I'm gonna make that image a little bit longer because whenever there's a fade, um, it can make the image feel pretty abrupt. All right. Then, I'm gonna add a fade here, make that a little bit longer, and we'll add our title. I'm gonna put the title, let's see. It's more in the middle, and then I like I like a font called Adamina, so I'm going to do that. And the title of the poem is going to be the title of my slideshow. All right, I'm going to center that. And then I'm gonna make sure that the graphic extends all the way. And I might actually have it overlap over the image just a little bit. And what I'll do is add an effect, um, an opacity effect. So I'm just gonna go over here, kind of turn that on. So it's automatically added a keyframe here at 100%. I'm going to add a keyframe at the end of this clip. Um, put this at 0%. All right, and I'll see how that looks. Wait, it's recording again? It's recording right now? Okay, I like that. Um, I think I'm going to make that first image just a little bit longer so that the fade over each other blends a little bit better. Let's see how that looks. Wait, it's recording again? It's recording right now? Okay, I like that too. All right. I'm gonna set all the images to frame size right now because some of them were vertical. And I want to make sure it fills that frame perfectly. And then we'll watch it through just to make sure there aren't any hiccups. Sorry, how did you set how, how did you how did you set the frame size so that the verticals would fill the Yeah, so I just highlighted all the images uh -huh. like that, grab them all, and then uh, right click on that and you're gonna scale to frame size or set to frame size. Because I, I actually will use either one interchangeably, and somebody can let me know if that's a bad idea. But um, I've never had an issue with it either way. And then, if you didn't like how it, so it's going to take your your portrait oriented ones, and it'll mm -hmm. crop them to fill the landscape oriented frame. Is that what that's doing? So it's not cropping. It's actually gonna it'll squish it so that I can oh. see the whole image in that frame. Oh, okay. We'll just play it and make sure Wait, everything looks okay. Again? It's recording right now? <sighs> Home, the smell of freshly baked goods, plants and Kona's rough but soft fur. The sound of laughter ringing, dog paws padding on the hardwood floors that ground you. The taste of your family's favorite foods, of the fresh air... <clears throat> You want to say it again? Mm. Okay. 
Where? Starting to oh, okay. Home, the smell of freshly baked goods, plants, and Kona's rough, rough but soft fur. The sound of laughter ringing, dog paws padding on the hardwood floors that ground you. The taste of your family's favorite foods, of the fresh air of your house. Oh, Elliot, come on. Oh my god, why? Why? Oh my god, Elliot, why is, just... is it so long? Okay, <laughs> uh, you. Can you just read the whole thing? No, because you have to read it too, okay? Why? So you end up hard to make, okay? Hmm? You end, taste your family's favorite foods, the fresh air of your house, and the fresh type of girls that dad worked hard to make. Okay? Fine. <coughs> Home, the smell of freshly baked goods, plants, and Kona's rough but soft fur. The sound of laughter ringing, dog paws padding on the hardwood floors that ground you. The taste of your family's favorite foods of the fresh air of your house and the fresh tapioca pearls that your dad that dad worked hard to make. The sight of the pictures mom took adorning the walls, memories frozen in time, feelings captured in the moment. The feel of warmth as you cuddle together before bed. And that everlasting feeling of home. hear that volume gradually ramp up. Sold. I want to buy them all. <laughs> Yay. It worked out well. Um, I press enter and it just helps to render and finalize, um, kind of process all the images and audio files and um, formatting them. I don't know <laughs> if I can explain rendering properly, but um, hopefully... Uh, is it generating like a new, like just composited, like baked file from all this then? Is this your output file that you would use on a website or something like that? Um, so I will export it in a minute. Rendering, I think okay. it's just kind of polishing the files as they are in the timeline um, and really formatting them properly. And then my playback, once I play it back, will be a lot more seamless. Got it. So this must be generating some like internal preview file that Premiere uses yeah. then. So it doesn't have to like render the composite end of your title and the photos live or something like that. Yeah. Okay. And then when you export, um, what or are you going to show us that process? Yes, we'll export it in a minute, a few minutes. 
Um, Jan yeah. says it's generating a VHS. <laughs> <laughs> We're going back. Yeah. Back to the 1980s, y'all. <laughs> Little vintage feel here. Yes. <laughs> It's interesting because like a lot of the um, that my favorite images in here aren't at all of doing big things or, you know, going on big adventures or having wild activities. It's just um, it's primarily just about connecting throughout the day and finding those little ways that we connect with each other. Um, so unless a family is on iPads all day, um, then really any, you know, any activities will work and well i'm out <laughs> that rules me out no i'm not no. in my head i pretty much sit here for eight hours a day <laughs> yeah so just while we're waiting for this uh, i'll remind everybody that uh in 24 minutes um we'll be um doing the artist spotlight where we take a look at uh, an artist from the Behance community. Um, and you can uh, nominate yourself or others um, for the artist spotlight segment. There is, I think, um, is there a space at the top of the chat on Behance uh, for people to do that? Um, Cody, you've been super helpful in the chat. So maybe you can just confirm in there um, what people need to do if they want to nominate someone. Uh, and we'll be we'll be doing that in just a little bit later in the show today. Well, so let me ask you a, a question, Margaret. The, um, mm -hmm. Do you the I was thinking of this with the audio recording of the poem that you had here. Um, do you ever capture video as well when you're doing these photo shoots with families? Um, sometimes they can add that as like a hybrid session, um, a video and photo hybrid. Um, and they can be really fun because then you're capturing kind of instead of this two dimensional aspect of a person, you know, throwing in that audio really helps to remember, like, I know that I have a hard time remembering what my kids sounded like when they were two or three years old and learning to talk. So um, I can help cement that for them. And it's another fun way to capture the day. Um, I will say though that it can be pretty tricky because uh, you have to figure out whether you want to prioritize the the photos or if you want to prioritize the video. Um, and so that might require a chat with the client. And get do you you feel like um, the smell does, of does one of them always kind of take over from the other? Yeah, like, kind of one of them has to be prioritized. Sound of laughter ringing yeah, because if, a, the if there's a moment that you. is happening... The Actually, wait, sorry, can I interrupt you? Do you mind pausing that playback yeah. while you answer that? Otherwise, sorry. I won't be able to follow. <laughs> um, I think that it's it can be tricky to um, photograph certain moments. I photograph and I video very differently like the way I compose a photo is going to be very different than the way I would video that moment. Um, so when a moment is happening, you really have to decide, do I want to be composing for video and turn on video or do I want to compose for the photo? And um, so that will, will depend on the priority of the family. If the family is like, I, we really want to make sure we have photos we can put on the walls or um, have a good, have something we can make an album out of later. You know, if that's the end result, the end goal, then you want to prioritize the photos. But if they want to like keep these on discs or thumb drives or something um, to watch in the future, uh, maybe if they're making a collection every year, um, then the video will want to be the priority in making sure that um, you get the video of the moment versus the photo. And that, that kind of gets to another question I wanted to ask about this. <laughs> when you do video for a family, what's what do you deliver to them? Not VHS, I'm guessing. Um, right. like how, do you, how do you get it to them? <laughs> That's super fun, though. Um, so I would do a, a digital download. And um, lately, I used to use a USB, but I find that a lot of people weren't really doing anything with their USBs. And it wasn't, you know, it's... It's nice in theory because they feel like they're getting something tangible, 
but um, but they never did anything. They would take it home. They wouldn't load anything onto the computer or back it up. Whereas if I gave them a digital download through Dropbox or through something else, um, they were much more likely to save it somewhere. And uh, whether that's to cloud or their own USB or something, um, they're much more likely to actually have it somewhere instead of just losing this tangible USB. So that's what we've been doing lately is um, just doing something simple like Dropbox or WeTransfer to get them that file. I've got it safely stored in the back of this drawer yeah. and nowhere else. <laughs> yes. <laughs> back up your files, people. Back up your files. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Like I, I've totally lost all our wedding pictures that were on CDs from back in the day. Oh no. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna export this. I finished this a lot faster than I planned to. All right, so we're gonna export this as a media. We're gonna give it a name. Um, I'm just gonna call it Adobe Live. And, oh, it went right into Adobe Live file. And the biggest change that I make is um, the bitrate settings. I learned this from a videographer actually when I used to do more video. And so they, they do a two pass um, encoding. And so I just do that now with any video and file like slideshow work. Um, oops. And, and is, this, is this complete? compression related? Is it controlling the size and quality of the file or? I want to say it's the size and quality, um, but I'm not super techie, so don't take my word for it. But that's that's just what I've noticed. Like if I just do a one pass bit rate encoding, I notice that my, um, the quality just isn't as good. We are going to take your word for it, by the way. Okay. You are the expert here. I don't know if you know that, but you are the expert. <laughs> Huh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to export that. And so that might take a little bit of time. I'm going to close audition because so we don't need that anymore. Uh, figuring out how to reduce the white noise of an audio file an audition is probably one of my favorite things uh, that I've learned when it comes to making these slideshows and videos. And you did that just by um, finding a quiet spot in the recording where no one was saying mm -hmm. anything. And then it essentially, <clears throat> whatever noise is there, it essentially subtracts that noise from the rest of the audio. Is that what it's doing? Yeah. Yep. It's just capturing that um, sound frequency and subtracting it from the entire clip. And so is that something that you do like when you're on location, do you make sure to like record this like room tone or whatever so that you have it? Or did you just get lucky? There was um, a break in there. <laughs> um, I think for this one I did, you know, I intentionally kind of started the recording really early, but I, um, I find that pretty much in any clip I've ever had, there's usually some sort of natural break or pause. And so you might have to like really magnify your timeline to find uh, a good quality chunk, but um, you could usually find something. Though, of course, the longer that chunk is the better because you'll get a better uh, capture of the frequency range, but um, um, usually there's some sort of natural break. And tell us about, so since we're all watching a progress bar, um, tell us about what, what comes next after this, after your export is completed. Um, so after this export, I will probably upload this to my YouTube channel as a private video. And then I'll prepare, um, I'll prepare their gallery. And that usually means that I'll take their JPEG files and I'll make a duplicate folder of JPEG files that are web-sized so that if they decide they want to share any on Facebook, then they have a set that's web-sized and they'll have a set that's high resolution for printing. Um, and then I'll, I, I use, I don't know if I'm allowed to say what gallery hosting I do, but um, 
going to say it. You're allowed to say it from my perspective. Okay. <laughs> I use Please. Pixie Set. Yeah, to share galleries. So um, I'll prep their, uh, I'll prep their gallery on Pixie Set and create the um, the respective folders so that they can download them um, if that's something they decide to purchase. And then I will upload the YouTube video to their um, to their gallery as a cover video, and that will allow us to watch that before we actually look through the gallery itself. Can you show us an example of, of what that looks like on Pixar? Yeah, Set? I'm gonna see if I can find uh, one of my, Let's see if I have a Pixar Set. And I'll just remind everyone, if you do have questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. And we'll be doing the artist spotlight in 20, 20 some minutes, 24 minutes. Oh, there's a countdown on the screen even. Artist spotlight <laughs> countdown, 23 minutes and 42 seconds. Okay. So you guys know when the artist spotlight is happening. I don't need to say anything about that. All right. So here's a, I think this one was a morning session. So here's the Pixie Set Gallery. You can see all the images load here. And so I have social media folder, high resolution folder, and then their video. And I, I noticed, did I notice um, you had uh, watermarks on the... Yeah, so Pixie Set, you can automatically uh, set a watermark for uh, the galleries. You just upload your watermark to Pixie Set, and then you can, as you prep your gallery, you can decide if you want it to add a watermark to the album itself. You don't need to watermark every individual photo. And so that's something you do just so that they can't be copied off of right. the website. But yeah. when they download the, the galleries, then they wouldn't have the watermark. Right. All right, can you pause this one? Yeah, and let me uh, I'll ask another question, actually, as I'm listening to this, I'm wondering, can you talk to us a little bit um, about licensing music? What's what's the process there? How do you how do you find this music to use? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I have a subscription to Soundstripe, and so that's usually my first place that I look for music because they have a pretty uh, wide selection of different types. Um, you can filter it by uh, genre, you can filter by um, like tempo and mood. So I often look for uh, either happy or calm or uh, chill, I think are some of the descriptors that it uses to filter different music bits. And then it can also filter by um, length of the music. And then every time you download, it's good for like one licensing. And I think they've just added a new thing where when you upload it to the YouTube, it gives you like a license tag that you can add to the upload so that they know that it's licensed and you're allowed to have it there. There's other, um, there's other really good music sites too. I just can't think of them anymore. It's, um, it, it, and you're gonna find a different range of licensing costs. So Soundstripe is great because it's, um, it's fairly affordable uh, considering I'm not making um, a ton of videos uh, every month kind of a thing. So I really just need to grab one or two. Um, then I can 
quickly go in there and look into my favorites folder from, you know, I, I maybe found a bunch of different music bits that I like, then I can favorite them and I can refer back to that folder whenever I need to. Um, but I know that there's other, uh, licensing places that you can find music that, um, maybe if you have different needs, like if you're going to do commercial work for it, you might need a different license for it. Then, um, you'll pay a little bit more, but then you find, you might find music that's a little bit more, um, in tune with what you need for that, uh, for that job or project. And I'm, I'm, I'm straying totally into the realm here of stuff that I don't really know anything about. Um, and so apologies for that, but I feel yeah. as an Adobe employee, I feel like I have to say that I believe it's also possible to license music from Adobe stock directly within Premiere, um, which is something people, oh, yeah. that's, that's the entirety of my knowledge on that topic. <laughs> um, but I, I think that it is possible. I think you're right about that. It's not something I've delved into yet, but now I, now I will. So that was an example of one of the mornings, morning in the life type of a session. And then afterward, we would go in and look at the gallery and take um, a closer look at it and decide if they want to purchase any prints or just a, a download a package um, or an album. All right, so it's going through its second pass of encoding. I was looking at your website um, and I noticed that you also, um, from your website, you sell um, prints of your, of your personal artistic work. Um, yeah. how, 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 how's that going for you? I don't know what <laughs> question to ask exactly about that, but like, do, do people buy prints of, of artistic work from photographers or do you find that it's not much compared uh, to the business you do with these family shoots? Um, I would say that's definitely more of my side gig rather than a main, uh, main avenue of income, but um, it's still fun to try. And every now and then I will get a purchase. And then that's, it's just neat to hear because usually people will tell me why they made that purchase. Um, if it connect, they connected with it, uh, or something along those lines. Yeah. I mean, that's really interesting because it's, of, of course you're, you're, you're taking beautiful photos. So if they're pictures of someone's family, they're going to be interested in them, but, but it's neat to have somebody who connects with your work. That's not personally relevant to them in any way you know it's not a picture of yeah. them or their family um i can pull it up if it helps but yeah let's take a look at it all right um so it's under the art shop and then it takes you to the gallery and some of it is like different projects i've done um so motherhood and enamel was like a visual poem that i did last year um, and so there are just, uh, it was a diptych project and then people buy them as a diptych image. I'm sure these sorts of comparisons are really irritating, but it, it feels very kind of Sally man to me. Thank you. I which, I, which I totally mean as a compliment. <laughs> yeah. I take that as a compliment. I don't know if it could be taken any other way. I right. Sally man's work is amazing. So uh. And these are older travel photos. And it's nice that you can decide what uh, print substrates you want these images on um, and work with that uh, with whatever gallery hosting company you decide to use. Yeah, I was gonna ask about that. How how does this work? I mean, you're not are you, you're not printing these yourself? Is this a service provider that you work with or how does that work? So I could, I could opt to uh, do it myself if I wanted. Um, 
there's different, uh, I guess, uh, modifications you can make. So if I want to self fulfill the product, I can, and I just, that's something I do on my end, uh, not something a customer would do. Um, but then uh, I would either work with a lab or if I have my own prints that set up, then I would print it from home. Um, but I personally will, I think mine are all set up as self-fulfilled. So I work with a lab that I have chosen and, you know, I, I really like their print quality, their color calibration matches mine. So that's the lab that I use. Um, and I like their paper substrates. Uh, but if I want to, I can also set it up so that it's lab fulfill. And then automatically, as soon as a purchase is made, um, my pick time will send the file to that lab and everything's done and automated on the back end. Is there a reason that you chose to do the self-fulfill? Uh, sounds, like, well, sounds like more work. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, I, I, I like to quality control it. I like to see the image and make sure it looks okay. Um, and then I also like to package it myself too. But I think I, I did have one of my, it's nice you can set it so that each gallery is different. So like, I think motherhood and enamel, I think is a self fulfill that I like to make sure it looks okay. Um, and then I had, I think I expired the gallery already, but it was a, an auto fulfill where it would just, you know, somebody could purchase and it automatically goes to the lab and they ship it out for me. And it's really easy. Somebody in chat asked if, um, does Adobe portfolio have any kind of shop shopping integration? I think the answer to that is no. I feel like that's something I should know. Um, mm -hmm. and I don't know for sure. So like Margaret, I have to say, don't take my word for it. Um, <laughs> yeah. but I think, uh, I think it doesn't. Um, you have a, you have a lot of, um, really nice food photography on your website as well. Is that something that you've done professionally? Uh, thanks. Uh, not a lot. Um, but I, I worked with somebody who was making a cookbook. So I did some kind of lifestyle images for them and then just on the side playing around with it. But, um, it's something I would like to get into more. I think it's a lot of fun. It feels like that could be a, a business too. Like I think the mm -hmm. two kinds of photography that people care about most are family photography and food photography. Right? <laughs> yeah. And maybe maybe travel photography. Too. <laughs> two uh, great loves, yes. Oh, and and Cody replied in chat, yes, it is possible um, on portfolio to set up links to Etsy shops. But oh. don't take don't take don't take Cody's word for it either. All right, <laughs> Cody. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> That's good um, to know. All right, we'll take a look. So it's almost done. And then. Oh, that last 1%. Yeah, always, always takes hard. the longest. Yeah, that takes the longest. <laughs> as hard as the first 99%. <laughs> For people and computers, apparently. like in those um i remember seeing a meme where it's like talking about the file transfer and how it goes from like this will be five minutes to this will be one year and 38 hours <laughs> You're like okay thank you i did have i was i i actually went to film school and mm -hmm. i used adobe premiere in film school which i'm not going to tell you oh. how long ago that was it was a long time ago and when you'd render out you know export a project uh it would give you a little indicator telling you how long it expected it to take a couple hours yeah. or however long it was going to be and uh it was always a little inaccurate at first <laughs> like right right when you started it would kind of be like getting its footing and it'd be like oh 10 hours oh no wait never mind 45 minutes and it would kind of figure itself out anyway on one on one uh, instance i started this video rendering and just for a moment fortunately at the beginning it said about three months <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't, I don't have, this is shared equipment at school. I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> but uh, didn't actually Just, take yeah. that long. Put a little post-it on that computer. Don't yeah. use. <laughs> Please don't <Yeah>. touch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to upload my video to my YouTube channel. Let's see.
it has a different file name because I had created it before. So it's got a different file name here. Just in case anybody saw that. Um, and then here in the description, you can put in, um, really it, it should only be the family that sees it because it's, um, cause I usually set these to private, but, uh, you can decide what you put in about the video. So usually the year. And how does, I've never done share privately on YouTube. How does that work? Is it like a password that you give them or how is that controlled? Uh, a link. So if they have the link, then they can watch it. But um, without it, they can't, you can't search on YouTube for it. You can find it on my channel. Um, yeah. Hmm. I wonder how is that different from unlisted? I could probably consult the internet to figure this out. But. So I, I like, I think <laughs> oh, this would be the way I'd them. have to, yeah. Okay. I'd have to share it. I see. Um, so you could do it either way, actually. Sometimes I do unlisted. Um, it just depends on, actually, you know what? Maybe I'll do unlisted because I'm trying to decide if I can remember if a uh, pixie set will grab it if it's private. And I can't remember, but I can, uh, in order to put it in the pixie set gallery, you have to have a link. So I'll go with unlisted. All right, seven minutes, guys. Let's see All if right. it actually finishes then. <laughs> well, we, do, <laughs> we don't we don't need to watch a progress bar for seven yeah. minutes. Yeah. Um, um, is there other stuff you'd want to share? Otherwise, I'm sure I can come up with some questions for you. Um, well, I was going to see if um, I had. I think I had talked to one of the producers about showing how to use um, a NIC plugin for black and white. Oh yeah, that would be fantastic. Processing. I think people would be very interested in that. When I say people, I mean me. <laughs> and I hope other people too. Let's see. Um, so let me grab an image that I might like to do. I really love these um, larger landscape ones. All right, so let's take a look at this one and we will use a plugin. It's Nick software um, that I bought a long time ago. And then it, I think Google bought Nick and then it became free after that. And now I think it's owned by, um, I don't know what they're called, like DXO or something. And so it it allows you to do certain kinds of black and white processing that you can't do, like in the Adobe Camera Raw plugin. Is that right? Um, yeah, it's just a I think different control aspects. Um, so you know, sometimes I love doing it in Camera Raw, but if I want something where I just want a little bit more control, then I like to throw it into Silver FX. All right, so just kind of straight out of the gate. Um, it's not too bad. Um, let's see, but I will do some selective edits. I like the background. I like to just reduce the contrast in the background just a little bit and brighten it a little. And so you just, you just clicked there, how is it? Like, how does that work? How does it know what part of the image to affect and what part? Ah, not? so these, yeah, these are control points. That's a really great question. Um, so let me put this control point in. And right here, you have a slider that tells you what radius it's going to affect. 
and what it does, what's different about it um, than a Toby camera raw that I find is different is it'll affect that specific um, like color tone right there. So it's grabbing wherever my point is, those greens, um, that's what it's affecting. Whereas I think in camera or Lightroom, it's affecting that entire bubble. Um, whereas this is, it's, it's only affecting those tones within that bubble, if that makes sense. I'll try to see if I can find a better image where I can really show what I mean by that. But for now, we'll finish this image. And then if there's time, I can grab a different image. Um, sounds like sounds like something that that um, ACR will do as well with color range masking. Um, oh if, yeah, if yeah. I'm understanding correctly, but it probably does. I'm just so um, I'm like so used to. It's not doing what I needed to. Um, I'm so used to doing it this way though. Um, let's see, I'm just gonna brighten her up a little bit. And then it's got three different control points um, that it shows by default, which is the brightness, the contrast, and the structure. Uh, structure being like detail. I love that um, ACR, I think that was one of their updates in the last couple of years was the structure slider. Yeah, ACR has a couple things that are sort of equivalent. None, none of them called structure, but there's clarity and there's texture. Oh, uh, texture, both. that's what it is. I think yeah. the texture is really similar to structure, and that's been one of my favorite additions to ACR. And just a heads up for you, Margaret, in three minutes, in two minutes and 48 seconds, we're going to start the artist spotlight. Um, and if you're not quite done with this at that time, that's fine. We can always come back to this um, for a couple minutes after the artist spotlight. All right. So don't rush. So I'm pretty happy with that, how that looks. Um, some things you can do, I don't really use this too often, but you can use the color filter and that'll change kind of the way um, it filters the, the black and white tones. So let me see if I can show you right now. So it's filtering reds, oranges, yellows, greens, and you can see how the leaves here pop when I did that. And if you don't want to use their preset ones, you can come down here and uh, just adjust it. I'm going to go with gray. So I put a little control point there, which added a little brightness to it. And I'm just going to add a little bit of fine structure. I'll save it like that. All right, and we're probably getting pretty close now. I'm just going to see. Hold on, you're muted. That would be the problem. We're there. We're ready. It's <laughs> okay. artist spotlight time. All right. <laughs> Thank you awesome. for letting me know I was muted. Hey. And so, so, so usually when I've, when I've hosted Adobe Live, um, 
I would I would drive the the artist spotlight portion. I'm not doing that today. Um, Margaret, you're driving here, and this is actually a photographer who you're acquainted with. Is that right? Yeah, she's a friend of mine. She's based down in Southern California. She also does documentary family work, um, but she's also spent the last couple of years branching into commercial work and editorial work. So that's been really fun to see. And she's taken kind of this approach with documentary work and applied it to her editorial work. And so it's really, I think it's really picked up for her over the past year or two. Do you find that there are um, photographers who you're especially interested in, uh, who who you um, who influence your work? Do you do you find your own work inspired or transformed by looking at other photographers' work? Yeah, and that can be really tricky, I think, because especially if you're a new photographer, because I can, um, I think that you can love somebody's work without necessarily wanting to be like them. Um, and it's understanding that when you appreciate somebody's work. Um, I'm trying to think if I can think of any examples off the top of my head. Um, let's see, I've loved like Alan LeBois' work and Sally Mann's work. Um, in terms of doing my client work like theirs, um, I've learned that I don't really want to do, to kind of have that same approach, but I do my personal work uh, inspired by them. What is, what is lifestyle photography? Oh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it really depends on who you ask sometimes, because I think sometimes lifestyle and documentary, the terms become a little bit muddied together. Uh, if you ask a documentary photographer, lifestyle work is something that kind of hints at real life, but is a little bit more polished. Um, so I call my portrait shoots lifestyle work. It's, we might go out into um, a field or into the woods and do portraits out there. Um, it's not the same as like studio work. We're not going in a studio and doing artificial light and really um, set poses, but there might be more candid work in, in my lifestyle work. Uh, I think in the commercial world, lifestyle and documentary um, are a little bit more blended because you can't do like full on documentary for a commercial job, but they may, they might want like a look that's very similar to documentary. And so in the commercial world, I would say that the closest you could get to documentary is going to be some kind of lifestyle work. Oh, there's me. <laughs> She's photographed us a couple of years ago. You made the portfolio. That's right. Yes. Yeah, this is really interesting. I mean, these are mm -hmm. all beautiful photos. I, I'm not sure that if you like hid the tabs up at the top that I would be able to tell you which of these was lifestyle and which of these was kids and family, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Which one is documentary work versus a lifestyle. Right. It's been um, so amazing to watch Tiffany grow and her business expand. She's been doing so much commercial work lately um, and small business work. I find that there's been a big shift in small business and with branding that they want more, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a more personable approach. And so they're looking more for like lifestyle and documentary photographers to help them get that message across of who they are and what their brand uh is on a more personal level i feel like that makes a lot of sense for a small business i mean you want imagery that's beautiful and but but not i don't know you don't want you don't want something slick like coca-cola or nike or whatever it might you know right it, yeah you want it to feel a little more real maybe <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
I think people are connecting more to the person beside behind the business versus just the product. Can we look at living with pickles? <laughs> that was the that was the that was the pig. That was the yeah, pig. Let me find him. Uh, <laughs> but these are sort of oh photo series or stories, is that right? Yeah. These are different projects. Um She's been hired to do lately. I mean, I said a pig. It is a pig, right? Okay, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a micro pig, if I remember correctly. Because there's a dog in here too. And I was like, wait, did I just call somebody's dog a pig? <laughs> wow. Oh my God. That's so cute. I want to photograph someone's pig. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Um, that's really precious. A little pig on a leash. Yeah. I did. I have a dog. I have a greyhound and, uh, I was walking him once and to be fair, it was nighttime and fairly dark, but somebody I was passing said, is that a goat? <laughs> <laughs> nope. Just my dog. I know that she's been walking, um, on a heritage project. And I wonder if that's something I can show. Yeah, what is that about? Um, let me see if I can grab it. And otherwise, if you can't find it, there was some pictures farther up of some people hanging out on a boat, which is pretty much what I want to be doing all the time. So I'd be happy to look at the boat pictures, the boat story too. Oops. All right. This was a project she did. I think she finished this earlier this year. Hopefully the sound works. Yeah, when I was that. in the sixth grade, I had to write a where I'm from poem. I wrote that I was from the billowing steam of a Chinese walk and the boba shops on Valley Boulevard, the oldest of three daughters. I didn't write that I came from an emotionally and verbally abusive home, from parents who conflated love through the loudness of their rage. They didn't know how to manage the trauma they inherited from their own parents. Cardinal rule number one of the Chinese family, always save face. I promise this is a story that honors my parents. This is a story about the slow and unsteady path toward reconciliation. My mom doesn't talk to me. I can count the number of times that my dad did talk to me. Both my parents describe their difficult childhoods in the present tense. Perhaps it's because they have kept the pain so close by. You hear so much negative in your life that when you do do something positive, you feel good about it. But then somebody says something like, why is it about you? You suppress your emotions. I am in a birdcage that I never knew the door is not locked. My parents never felt parented. Then they had a family of their own. They both offered self-reflections. At what time in your life would you want to relive? When you guys were little. Why? To redo some of the mistake I've done. Mm -hmm. Basically, trying to be a better mother. Yes, I provided. When it comes to family life, I didn't have the relationship like most parents I see now. Uh, it bothers me. Can people change? And when they do, can the static narrative I've held onto about my parents change? I usually see mom and their daughters have a close relationship and I long for it. I still would like to have a close relationship because the disconnect has been there for many years. I don't know how to fix it. So what do you think? Well, I think it starts here, conversations like this, mm. and your willingness to let me be here and tape you and photograph you 
That's a lot to allow someone to do. I don't have any reason not to. You're my kid. They are also human. Their echoes of, I never learned to be a parent, no longer feel like excuses. They are cries for empathy. My parents became grandparents. Softer around the edges, they nurture my kids and smother them with affirmations, hugs, their favorite fruits. Being able to be a grandparent, it's a great feeling, knowing that you get to do things all over again. Also be more connected with your own children, knowing that, yeah, you have a second chance. I ask for God to give me chances to make up towards you guys, even through the grandkids. That's my chance to make up. So how do we heal from here? We no longer need to return to the bitter root. Our traumas no longer all consuming fires, but wisps of smoke and the incense of the ancestral shrines we no longer worship. We can forgive 77 times seven times. We can hold on to joy. I mean, doing it is not easy. Saying it is a lot easier. You know, you say, like, okay, let's move forward. It's like, well, what happened to the weight from the past? How do you unload it? My parents did what they did. I have to stop blaming them. And if you don't change now, you're just going to be stuck in the past. I think you need to include humility, grace. When we don't know how to deal with generational curses, we bring it along and we live it and pass it down. And if we don't break that cycle, knowingly, unknowingly, we bring it with us. So we're sticking together and, and then look toward the future. I know in my bones that the next generation's legacy will not be trauma. They will know hope, that they are seen, that they are loved. They do not need to carry the deep wounds. They can live a different story. And I sometimes could find joy, even though it's bits and pieces. And I hold on to that peace and joy within me. I'll be okay. Let's do this. If you suddenly and unexpectedly feel joy, don't hesitate. Give in to it. Don't be afraid of its plenty. Joy is not meant to be a crumb. I have something in my eye. Uh, I mean, let, let me ask you a, a question about this, because I feel like this is something you could really speak to. Um, and I don't know exactly what my question is, but I feel like it takes a lot from a person and from an artist to put something so personal out there. Um, and I feel like you've done some of that with your work as well, with your personal work that's on your website. How do you, I don't know, how do you get to that place and what sort of reactions do you get to that work when it's out in the world? Mm, yeah, it's a lot of uh, emotional energy. I think that's what you're speaking to when you talk about like the the toll it can take. Um, I think when artists create work like this, they're hoping to speak to something that maybe some something inside them that needs to be seen. Um, with the hope that there are others who understand and will feel seen by that work as well, if that makes sense. Um, you know, I've done some work regarding uh, gender and race that I think um, were fueled by a hope to inspire a more nuanced, deeper conversation and for the most part, as far as I know, I've gotten um, positive feedback and meaningful feedback about those bodies of work. Um, yeah, so it, it can be very vulnerable to, to put those kinds of 
um, works out there because you just don't, you just really never know how people will receive it. Um, and you can't control how people will receive it either. You can't control what, how they interpret the work that you make. Um, you can only do what speaks to you and um, create work that resonates with you. And hopefully, you know, the, the people who see it and um, find it will, it'll resonate with them. Um, but you just, yeah, it's hard to ever know for sure whether it will or not. And when you do personal work, I mean, by definition, it's personal and, and presumably the person you're most concerned about satisfying with that work is yourself. Mm -hmm. um, do you find, having said that, do you find that other people's reaction to your personal work influences the personal work that you do in the future? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I think, you know, I do work with mentors who, who they themselves have done personal work and, um, have more experience than I do. So then they can give me feedback on maybe where I need to push a little bit more or dig deeper or clarify something. Um, especially if like an artist statement is confusing or if, um, uh, or if they're not sure why I made certain artistic choices, they want to make sure that I'm making choices that really speak to the project and to the messages that I'm trying to get across. Um, but I find that really when you're making any sort of project, you have to ask yourself, you know, what, what am I trying to say with it? And um, in the end, it's kind of like what you said, you have to satisfy yourself, but there's also an accountability aspect. Who else does this project serve and who could it hurt? You know, so um, <clears throat> like I'm doing a, a book project right now about my experience of motherhood but in that project there's pictures of my kids and so i have to think about you know how am i what message am i getting across about them and how will this serve them or hurt them in the future and um and so that has shaped a little bit of how i make that project um and how i write about it uh and like I have a project on racism and um, ultimately the goal is to speak towards racism and how we can talk about the nuances of it. And so what do I actually need to do for that work? You know, I don't need to mention names of people that doesn't serve the greater message that I want. Um, and it doesn't necessarily, you know, like the purpose of it isn't to um, call out people, I guess. So in the end, what am I trying to do with that work and how do I make sure I take steps that really are holding myself accountable to, to other people who could be hurt by it. Um, while also forwarding this conversation along, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can we take a quick look at uh, one or two more of the stories from Tiffany? Uh, yeah. The um, photo series. It doesn't have to be the boat one, but I was just curious. Uh, I'm always really interested to see photos put together to kind of tell a, um, tell a story. So I'd like to see what she's done yeah. with some of these. Boat life. Boat life. Take a look. Gonna have to go spend the rest of the day outside after looking at this picture. <laughs> Yeah, she really has like a, I don't know, just a really nice, like really identifiable, but in no way over the top kind of style to her work. Mm -hmm. I think it's really nice. Really, really great stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, we have about five minutes left in our show here. I feel like maybe we... Um, I don't know if we cut short the the black and white photo processing part a little bit. Is there some additional stuff that you would like to get back to in the last few minutes that we have? Yeah, let me take a look. I think there 
was. And for everybody who's joined us in the live stream today, chat's been a little quiet. Please do feel free to speak up in these last few minutes here if you have anything you'd like to ask Margaret. I think I'm gonna look at this one in black and white. Um, Uh, so Nick has a whole bunch of different plugins. Um, I, I've always just focused on silver effects. Uh, it's got all my old control points that I just used. So I'm going to get rid of those. And let's see. Bring that background down just a little bit. I think it's already down from my camera raw um what was i saying my camera raw uh edits so i've got that in there as well just want to brighten her face just a little bit so you can see that it's mostly affecting this tonal quality right here and it's capturing a little bit of that same tonal quality right in there I'm going to activate that one and see if I can adjust it a little bit more. Brighten it. Just so it doesn't become a dark blob back there. I'm going to brighten her so that she's a little bit more separated from the background. And the same with dad. Does silver effects allow you to see the mask? Like, is there any kind of overlay or something you can turn on where you can see the area that one of these control um, points is masking? It's it's not a test. I don't know the answer. I've, <laughs> not, I've, ne I've never used silver effects, so I was just curious. I'm fairly certain. All right. So in the compare tab, so this is the before and that's the after. So I I've brighten them up. I think that's the most noticeable adjustment and darken the background a little bit. I actually don't know if I want it that dark though. There we go. I think I'm pretty happy with how that looks. Um, for whatever reason, my plugins uh, are a little bit weird, so I have to click on the Silver Effects Pro again to get it to actually apply. But that's how it looks. Is that? Well, we have about one minute left here for any last kind of thoughts you'd like to leave us with. Oh, I don't have any um, that I can think of. Um, yeah, I think it, it was a great time though. I hope everybody managed to get something out of it. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to send them over, I guess. <laughs> Well, I, I have I don't see anything in the chat at the moment. Oh, uh, Jan is saying the mask is one of the buttons next to the control points in the list. Um, so mm. I, I can check that out on my own time. Um, let, let me ask a question then, since there's nothing in chat. And again, we have um, maybe 30 seconds here. Um, but you mentioned mentors earlier. And could you take just like 20 or 30 seconds and tell me a little bit about how, how mentors have been important to you in your own developing your own work? Yeah, yeah, I think it's great to work with. Um, I think it depends on what you're doing specifically, but I think a mentor can really help with any type of project that you're working on, um, or if you're trying to hone in on a specific skill or um, working towards um, 
maybe you're just working on some kind of like what you perceive as a deficit in your skill set. Uh, I think a mentor could be really great for that. Um, and other times, sometimes it's just nice to work in a class and a class can help with just breaking creative boundaries and um, seeing how other people are working on things and getting uh, ideas and um, just finding ways to branch a little bit more. Well, Margaret, thank you so much for all of this. This has been really fantastic. And everybody who joined us live today, uh, thank you as well so much. Um, stay tuned. We've got the Illustrator Daily Creative Challenge replays. Um, and that will be followed by part two of Heather Lynn's graphic design live stream at 12 p.m. Pacific time. And then stick around for a new show with our very own Cody Bear, our chat moderator here. Thank you, Cody. It's called Draw This in Your Style. And that starts at 3 p.m. Pacific today. Thank you, everybody, so much. Bye-bye.